Good morning, guys. How's everybody doing today? We got the cleanup crew coming through. Somebody left this here. I would say it's a kid's, but it was left here at the altar. If anybody knows whose it is. Bella's been carrying it around, but it's not Bella's, so. All right, guys, welcome to church. If you're new here, we're a little bit laid back, and that's okay. Uh, I do have a few announcements. Oh, boy. All right, uh, today, following second service, we're headed to the creek. So if you guys want to go, uh, I'd say we'll be out the creek, depending on how long Dustin preaches, about 1230-ish. 12.15 for sure. There'll be people out there. Uh, I know some people are leaving after this service to start cooking, setting up. If you want to come be a part, you want to go hang out with them, head out there. Um, it'd be an awesome time. I'm not even sure how many baptisms we have, but we've got a few. And then this evening at 6 o'clock, uh, we'll have worship and prayer night here at church. They had it last month. We're going to try to have it the first Sunday of every month. So if you want to be a part of that, 6 o'clock this evening, it'll just be a free night of worship, prayer, uh, just laid back, a lot of, probably several songs. So come be a part of that. Uh, we got candy drop off for trunk or treat. It's hard to believe that's right around the corner, but it is. So if you want to grab some candy and drop it off for that, we'll have a big, a big event here. Uh, the kids are singing after, or after. Right before second service today, if you want to stick around and listen to the kids sing, they got five, six, seven, how many songs they got? 22. 22. Okay. So we'll be at the creek at 2 o'clock. Um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, so yeah, stick around, listen to the kids sing. Yesterday, you guys are awesome. You brought food for the Dennis family. They had lots of food. If you brought a crock pot or anything, they're in that room where that exit sign is. There's a room to the left. They're all right in there. Um, washed and ready for you to pick up, and thank you very much. Uh, that, that is being the church for family. That is awesome. Um, still got a sign-up sheet in the lobby for Tara and I's class starting October 5th. Uh, we got to order books. That's why we have a sign-up sheet. You can uh, check to order your own, or we'll order them for you. Either way, look forward to that. And then this week has been an awesome week church just in this church there were six salvations this week um, then Friday night I was at bounce back and I know there was one correct me it was one one at bounce back Friday night and then uh, last night was big house redemption here and they had four last night so as awesome kingdom work it was awesome they left here last night and uh, I think baptized six at the creek, I believe. They left here right after uh, redemption and had some creek baptisms in the dark. So that's awesome. I uh, think that, oh no, Kyle Thomas, if you guys know Kyle, he comes here. He usually is running around with Sean. But he had an accident this week, decided to try to stab himself. He cuts meat. Um, so he, he's had some surgeries and stuff. They're going to do a fish fry fundraiser, possibly the 23rd. Is that what you said, Derek? So they're looking for some supplies for the fish fry, as in fish, and all the stuff to go with it. The man talking right there, or me, any of us get with us, and we'll, uh, we'll try to get that rolling for Kyle. Is Kyle still in the hospital? Okay. He got to come home yesterday. So keep Kyle in your prayers. Um, yeah, 39 staples. and I've got a picture if you want to see it, but I don't think you do. So. But anyways, be in prayer for Kyle. Um, also got this just here, a Pure Joy event in uh, Mountain Grove, right? Yeah, Mountain Grove Family Church, Saturday, September 24th for ladies. Um, there's some of these flyers around. Check it out. Go support. I think that's all I got. That's all I got. All right, stand with me. We're going to go in time of worship. It's going to be a great day. It's been an awesome week. It's been a tiring, awesome week. All right, pray with me. Without the preaching of the cross, without preaching the cross to ourselves all day and every day, 
we will very, very quickly revert to faith plus works as the ground of our salvation. So that to go to the old uh, Fort Lauderdale question, if you were to die tonight and, and, and you were getting entry into heaven, what would you say? If you answer that, and if I answer it in the first person, we've immediately gone wrong. Because I, because I believed, because I have faith, because I am this, because I am continuing. Loved ones, the only proper answer is in the third person, because he, because he. Think about the thief on the cross. And what an immense... I can't, I, I can't wait to find that fellow one day to ask him, how did that shake out for you? Because you were, you, were, you, were, you were cussing the guy out with your friend. You'd never been in a Bible study. You'd never got baptized. You, never, you didn't know a thing about church membership. And, and, yet, and yet, you made it. You made it. How did you make it? That's what the angel must have said. You know, like, what are you doing here? Well, I don't know. What... What do you mean you don't know? Well, because I don't know. Well, you know, (laughs) excuse me, let me get my supervisor. Think I'll get the supervisor ranger. So we have just a few questions for you. First of all, are you, are you, are you, are you clear on the doctrine of justification by faith? (laughs) I said, I've never heard of it in my life. And, and what about, uh, let, let's just go to the doctrine of Scripture immediately. This guy's just staring. And eventually, in frustration, he says, on, on what basis are you here? And he said, the man on the middle cross said, I can come. <laughs> we all need a little encouragement today, right? We just need some encouragement. If you're in fifth or sixth grade, you can head that way and head over to... Uh, the yeah, room across the, the hall, they'll show you where it's at if you've got any questions. Um, but I was, I was sent that this morning. I've heard Alistair Begg multiple times. Amazing accent. So, and a really great preacher, too. But uh, I, uh, I, I, I heard that this morning, and I got excited about it because it just reminds me that I just need to keep it simple. You need to keep it simple. And we need to focus on Jesus. And, and we and we got to understand how easy and simple God made it for us. That doesn't mean that we won't have trials and tough times, but it means that he's made it easy and simple for us so we don't have to overcomplicate it. And so I'm excited this morning to be here with you guys. I'm excited because worship was awesome. The church filled in a little bit. I was afraid I ran everybody off last week. It's Labor Day weekend. We'll say it's light because of that. But <laughs> listen, God is so good. Like there was four salvations last week in, in Sunday services. And there was, we, there was a, a couple people that called and said they gave up drinking alcohol. And there was a couple people that have said they've given up smoking pot. And, you know, I'm, I, and I, you can get mad at me all you want, but if God's doing those things, I think he's working. And I'm just excited about that. And it reminds me this week that it's not about me. It's not about you. It's about him. And it's not about the thieves on the cross. It's about the one in the middle, the one that loves us so much that he got up there willingly. Those two on the side were not up there willingly. They were up there because they had done some stuff wrong. The one in the middle, Jesus Christ, had done nothing wrong. Perfection got up there willingly. And the things he endured on the way to that cross was just amazing what he did for us. So we're going to be in uh, 2 Chronicles, Uh, right? Let's let's get into Chronicles. And uh, and we're going to be in uh, 2 Chronicles 6. And, and we're going to be talking about the impacts that we have on the people to come. On the people behind us. On the people that are, 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 are coming up behind us. Or maybe those that are, are not as far along in their walk. Or maybe those that don't believe yet. Or maybe it's, maybe it's children that aren't born yet. You know, we get so caught up on these are the end times. Listen, to be saying the end times forever. Let's, not, let's take that for, for serious. But let's also understand that it may be a few generations down the road, so we've got to live right right now so those generations know how to do it. And, 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 and we, we get caught up. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. We'll get you one if you don't have one. 
I want you to have one. We've got lots of them. We can give you one. And uh, I want you to be excited about understanding that God wants you to be part of his family. He wants you to be his child. You know, a real, a real parent, the ones that do it, that do it right, they love their kids unconditionally, right? They, they hug them, they, they, they teach them, they love them. And this is, what Jesus, this is what Jesus died for so we could be that to God. So he can, he can, he can show and we can feel his love. And so I, I get excited about that because that made a difference in my life. It made a difference in my eternity. And I think about the family impact that, that we have, and I think about the kingdom impact that we have on the generations behind us. And listen, if you've not been a great parent to this point, or maybe you've flubbed some stuff up, well, welcome to the club, because we've all been there. But that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean you can't change things, because my favorite phrase is, it's not about what you've done, but what you're about to do next. Because it's about what you're going to do next, because you can repent and change. That can be this, that can be your legacy. Repent and change. And, and, and we can either be the generational curse or we can be a generational blessing. We choose that. We can't blame Satan. We choose which one we want to be. We choose which avenue we're going to go down in that, in, that, in that walk. If we're going to be a blessing to the future behind us or if we're going to be a, a curse carrier and make them have to figure it out on their own along with our baggage. And I'm not just talking to your kids. I'm talking about those who don't believe. If you're a believer, you're putting your baggage on other people if you're not giving them Jesus. And so, and so I want you to know you are part of either the generational curse or you're part of the generational blessing. Well, Pastor, I don't even understand what this generational curse is. That's those things that get passed on. And we blame it because that's just who we are. I'm an alcoholic because my dad was a drinker. I'm a, I, I do drugs because my family did drugs. Or I, I'm a thief because that's what the family name's known for. No, you can be the chain breaker Amen. by just asking the one that can break the chains. And so I want you to know today it's about impact that you have on your family. I'm going to share a little bit about uh, my own family, my daughter. I love, I love my daughter. I think she's teaching downstairs, right? So she'll get mad at me later. My daughter's read the Bible forever. She's been in church her entire life. Praise God. I've not always been a great dad, and Shannon's not always been a wonderful mom, but, and, and we still have our moments, but she's been in church her entire life. But she just, for the first time, completed a full book in the Bible by herself, studying all the way through from beginning to end, and she was so excited about it. She studied the book of John front to back, and she's always studied that she's been in the Word a long time, but she studied the full book by herself studied it through, and was just so excited about it. You know, that, that, that absolutely changed me when, when they told me, when Shana told me, and then Callie told me. I'm like, that's because, that's because I wouldn't let any excuses come in. I believe that was because I wouldn't let the excuses come into my life. Well, it's just because, and she's going to have to deal with it and figure it out on her own. No, we are her parents. We're supposed to deflect the, the evil and, and let her feel God's blessing that we're feeling. And I'm not, a, like I said, I'm not a perfect parent, but when she says that and she's excited about it, that gets me excited. If she's excited about reading a full book of the Bible, slowly studying it verse by verse by verse, that's exciting. I know adults that haven't done that yet. And this just 15-year-old girl says, I'm so excited because it was my first one, which means to me, you've got plans for another one. And so I get excited about the fact that she's not taking on a generational curse because of me and Shana. We, we've had to change some stuff to make this happen. Because we could have easily said, listen, we're just gonna, it's, it's just who we are. If you want to change, you've got to change. We said, no, that's enough. We're going to make a kingdom impact in our children's lives. And we're going to do what we can to be a blessing to them. No matter what happened before, no matter how rough of parents we were before, it's about what we do now and next. And so I want us to get into Second Chronicles and understand the power of what we're leaving behind. We're leaving a legacy or we're leaving a disaster. And I don't want my children to have a disaster. This world's got enough of a disaster of itself without me piling on to them. And we pack all this baggage and we either give it to them or we get rid of it. 
And the same thing with those that we're supposed to share the truth with, the gospel truth with, which is what we're all called to do as believers. We're either piling on the garbage and disaster, or we're sharing a legacy of Jesus with them. We've seen so many, I love this, we've seen so many adults get saved in this church. And I I get salvations are the same, no matter who it is. But there's something special about an adult that gets saved. Because a lot of times children get saved because they're raised up in it. An adult has to make an adult decision that I'm going to be different. I'm going to be set apart right now and where I'm at, where I'm at, and it's going to look different. And so we've got to see so many of those. That excites me. That just, that just ignites my, my fire for, for seeing that. Because you know what that means? That is people saying, I'm tired of the disaster. I want to leave a legacy of Jesus. So that should fire us up, Christians. That should fire us up that we should, uh, we should get excited about things we do in our life. Listen, we're not perfect. We're weird people. We're strange people. Yeah, I went to, I went to Clint's shop this week and watched him try to chase a hummingbird out of, the, out of the shop with a box. We're weird people. He's like, get out of the way of the door. I'm trying to get the hummingbird. I'm like, ah, $10,000 if we catch this on video. But we didn't get it on video. But we're, we're, we're different people. We're strange people. But that doesn't mean that in our strange, weird life that we live every single day that we don't share Jesus with people. That we have to do that. We've got to leave a legacy and not a disaster. So I want you to follow along as I read through Second Chronicles 6, 1 through wherever we're going to stop at, probably about 15 it looks like, or wherever the Lord says. And in verse 6, or chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Then Solomon said, The Lord has said that he would dwell in, a thick, in the thick cloud. I have built you a lofty house and a place for your dwelling forever. Then the king faced about and blessed all the assembly of Israel, while all the assembly of Israel was standing. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who spoke with his mouth to my father David and has fulfilled it with his hands saying, since the day that I brought my people from the land of Egypt, I did not choose a city of all the tribes of Israel in which I would build my house that my name might be, be there. Nor did I choose any man to, for a leader over my people Israel. But I have chosen Jerusalem that my name might be there. And I have chosen David to be over my people Israel. Now it, is, now it was in my heart... Now it was in the heart of my father David to build a house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. And the Lord said to my father David, because it it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, you shall not build the house, but your son who will be born to you, he shall build the house for my name. Now the Lord has fulfilled his word, which he spoke For I have risen in this place of my father David and sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord had promised and have built the house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. There I set the ark in which is the covenant of the Lord, which he had made, which he made with the sons of Israel. And then in verse 12, it goes on to say, Then he stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands. And, and now Solomon had built a bronze platform, five cubits long and five cubits wide and three cubits high. And he set it in the midst of the court. And he stood on it and he knelt on his knees in the presence of all of the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands towards heaven. He said, O Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven or on earth, keeping covenant and showing loving kindness to your servants who walk before you with all their hearts. Who, was, who has kept the secret, or the, who has kept your servant David, my father, that which you have promised him? Indeed, you have spoken with your mouth and have fulfilled it with your hands as it is to this day. I want you to understand, there, first of all, there's so much to unload right here, but, but there's, there's a legacy that's left behind because of David's heart. To serve the Lord. Now we know David wasn't perfect by any means. David had some real serious flaws, which should tell us it doesn't matter this morning what you're sitting here with. It's about what you do next with it. It's about how you ask God to forgive you with a sincere heart and try your best 
to move forward with him. That's all God wants is your best, your best effort, because he'll take care of the rest, because your best effort is a fail anyway, but your best effort is all he wants so he can take care of the rest. And, and so we know David. David, <laughs> David has done some really messed up things. There's been murder. There's been, there's been affairs. There's been all kinds of things going on in David's life that is not good. And so when we look at our lives, we're like, well, how often do we look at our lives and think, well, why would God ever forgive me? Because that's what he is. He's a forgiving, loving God. But he requires a sincere repentance. The thing about David is David, when David messed up, he really messed up. Man, he, he messed up big time a lot. But when he messed up, he realized he messed up, and he's seen the flaws, and he's seen the break between him and God, and he, he didn't like that. You see, when we mess up and we sin, when we're like David and we make mistakes and we sin, we need to realize the separation between us and God in that moment, and we need to desire that to be fixed. And the only one that can heal that up is literally Jesus. So we need to call out to him and say, please help me. Because I feel the void, I feel the gap, I feel the fact that I, I am more cursed than blessing right now. And you, you won't live a perfect life on this earth. I know there are doctrines out there that say when you're set apart, you should be perfect. They absolutely should be, but we're not. But we should be striving for it. And whenever we strive for it, we recognize the moment that we're not in tune with God. When we walk in the door, it is absolutely whatever you look like, that's who you should be when you come in the door because I expect nothing different because that's who you are. That's what the world has made you to be, and you've accepted it. But when you come in this door, my hope is you hear the gospel truth, the word of God, the very truth of this book, and you desire to be different than who you were when you walked in. And if we're not desiring that, then we are just playing a game. We're just checking a box. We're just filling the seat. You know, when I listen to him preach, I've seen people in the back, and they look like they were about to, I, 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 I used to go to a suit and tie church, and I could never tell if you're at a funeral or if you're at the church. But, you know, when he was preaching that, I started to hear people cheer. You could hear him in the background. You could hear him clapping because that's exciting to know that Jesus got up on that cross, and he was the difference maker for David. He's a difference maker for Dustin. He's the difference maker for put your name in there because that's the difference maker. You didn't have another option. And so we see this scripture like this, and we think, well, it's a great, and you know, it's titled in my, in my, in my Bible, Solomon's Dedication, because he's dedicating it to, to God, and he's given his He's given glory to God, which is great, and he's given some praise to his father for, for, for following after God and being honored by God. And, and so he's doing some stuff. But, you know, I really see the kingdom impact is a family impact. Solomon's there because David kept repenting with a sincere heart. No matter what he did, he was always coming back saying, God, I messed up. I didn't do like I was supposed to. The world got me. I got caught up in it. They tricked me again. I fell for it. I did it. Or maybe I willingly did it in the moment and, then, and my flesh took over. Whatever the excuse is, whatever the, the reason is, he said, please forgive me because what doesn't matter why I did it. It matters that I did it. And now I need a Savior. And every single time, God showed up. And so Solomon says, the Lord said he would, be, he would dwell in a thick cloud. He says he'll dwell in a thick cloud. He won't be small. He won't be a little meek God. He's a powerful God. He's a thick cloud. He's all over the place. You can't escape him. You can't hide from him. You can't sin inside your house with the doors locked and the shades pulled and he don't know. He knows it all. He says, I built a lofty house, a place for you to dwell forever. You know what? He knew that that was a place for him to dwell, but he knew he was going to be all over. The whole thing about building a temple was about, about building a place of respect, a church, a place to go inside and, and seek him out, to go as believers and be in the presence of the one God that could change everything. That's what we're doing today. We're not just playing a game. We didn't walk into church just to hear a sweet passage from, from Scripture and, and, and walk out saying that was really cute. We came here today to have our lives changed. 
I came here today to share a message that hopefully you say, I want to be a completely different person, even if I was a really great Christian coming in, because I need to be better. We should desire that. And if God's going to be in the thick cloud around us, he's right here in the thick cloud. This, you know, here's what's crazy is that temple that, temp, that uh, Solomon built for God that day has no more power than the one we were standing in. Because it has the same power of the same God. And here's what I love about it. Is, is, he is, he is, he's not going to leave us. Even when we don't even want to talk to him or we want to ignore him, he's still there. You know that, you know how you, <laughs> poor moms, they get the worst of it. Kid follows you everywhere. You can't go to the bathroom, right? You can't even get the bathroom break. Anybody have that kid that likes to sit in your, in, sit right there in the bathroom like, then you got the dog and you got the cat and it's like, I can't even get away. Any moms feel like that? Any dads feel like that? Yes. Oh, I'm, <laughs> Derek feels like that with Melissa, I've heard. <laughs> He's like, I can't get a break. But, you know, listen, it's, it's about the fact that, you know how you can't get away from those kids? That's how God is. He's always there. Well, God's not talking to me. He ain't talking to me. Well, you, are you opening the word? Because that's where he talks to you. I hear people say, I haven't heard from God in forever. Why is God not speaking to me? Very clearly, you're not opening the word. Because the moment you open it up and you read one sentence, he has just spoken to you. Amen. He has just spoken right into your ear, spoke something to you. Now, the fact of the matter is, are we reading it and are we learning and are we wanting to do it? Are we wanting to have God in the thick cloud in our church? Yes. The answer is yes. Oh, Lord, I don't want to have church without you. If we're not going to be here, I'm going home. Because I know he's at my house. I've invited him. I know he's there. So if we're not going to have him, if we're not going to invite him into church building, there's no sense in coming. But he's invited here. I believe so because I, I don't think we have 10 salvations over the last week if he's not. Because you know what? I can't save you. The best preacher can't save you. Alistair Begg and his awesome accent can't save you. But you know who can? The God that's thick in the cloud. And so we built a house for him right here. You know what? We're going to build one in Mountain Grove. And you know the same God's going to be there that's right here? And I believe there's going to be salvations galore down there because I believe God is working. But there won't be one salvation if the saved don't do their job. Because God expects us to bring them in. How do we get them in here? We don't sit in here waiting for them to walk in the door. We go outside and we meet them. We say, hi, how are you doing? What church do you go to? Oh, have you heard of renovation? Yes. <laughs> Come try it out. It's real. On, right? Some people even throw an S on it. It's renovations for some people. Huh? With a Z. Okay, it's renovations with a Z. But we have, a, we have a house we built for God, just like him. I want you to realize how real the Bible is in your own life. It's not just a story time for fun times of what Solomon did. Solomon was wise, and he got to do great things. But you know what? The wisdom he has comes from God, the same God that can give you wisdom right now. And so when you're wondering, how can I figure this out? Well, ask him. The king faced about and blessed all the assembly of Israel. How awesome is that? He prayed for them. The king prayed for them. He, he invited the God of gods, the only God, into the church house, and then he prayed for the people. That's a good king. Could use a president like that. We could use a governor like that. We could use a mayor like that. We could use some Christians like that. And we, you know, we want to expect things upward. How about we send it up? How about we send it upward? Then, then, he, then he turned around and he, play, he prayed for him. And he, and he said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who spoke with his mouth to my father David and has fulfilled it with his hands, saying, since that day, he's talking, about, he's talking about that day when he said, he said, when I removed you from Egypt, things changed for you because you started to believe and you started to see it was a real struggle before Egypt. But guess what? It was a real struggle after Egypt because people are still people. The biggest problem with us is us. 
We get mad at us, and we get mad at each other, and we are so upset, and someone preaches the truth, and we get so offended by it. Well, go talk to God about it. If you don't like somebody else, don't get mad at them. Go talk to God about it. God changed my heart on the matter. Even if they made me so mad, I still need to love them. Help me love them, God. And then help me see the truth you were trying to tell. Help me see the truth that you were trying to get me to see. Help me understand. You know what's happening right there? It's a God-centered life. Solomon is introducing those people in that church at that moment to a God-centered life. He said God is present because he said he would be. God is present because he said he would be. So we're going to invite him into the house that we built for him. The house we built for him. Not the house we built for ourselves. We don't go to church to be consumers of the church. We go to church to be servers of God. Blow your mind. But we go to church to be servers of God. And, and, and if we do that, everything changes. All of a sudden, I'm not so mad when someone says something that offends me because it's in the Bible and I don't like it. All of a sudden, I'm like, well, let me, let me read about it and let me pray about it and let me talk to my God about it because that's where I need to get my answers from. If he gave Solomon wisdom, he'll give me wisdom. I have no doubt in that. But I've got to ask him for it, for his wisdom. Not for just a little bit. God, help me understand just a little bit, and I'll take care of the rest, which is what we tend to do. God, give me a little bit of something. Give me a little bit of inkling of something, and I'll figure out the rest on my own. We do that all the time, but he's saying it's a God-centered life. It's a God-centered life. I brought, since, since the day that I brought my people from the land of Egypt. I did not choose a city of all the tribes of Israel in which to build a house, or my name might be there, nor did I choose any man for a leader over my people Israel. You know why? Because he wanted them to strictly follow him. God never desired for people to have a king, a president, a mayor, a governor, none of that. He wanted them to have a pastor, a priest, whatever you want to call them, that prayed for them and led them in worship. And worship isn't just music. Worship is opening that word and getting into it. This is all worship right here. Your life should be worship. Well, pastor, how does that work? That means that you're walking out the word of God. You can't walk out the word of God if you don't open it up and learn it. So your life can't be worship if you never read this word. It can't be worship if you're not reading it. God did not desire for man to be the leader. God desired for man to serve. He sent the perfect serve example. Jesus was the serving example. Served up his life. Served up his life so we can get excited about church. Served up his life so we can not just sit dully waiting for something really cool to happen and we tell people about it and then go back to normal. He, didn't, he served up his life so that 10 salvations could happen and we can get excited about it. That 10 salvations could happen, we can be like, okay, Lord, let's see 15 this week. But no, we go like, we go so like, oh, we're like the people in the crowd, like, uh, we're dressed for the funeral when we should be dressed for the party. God didn't, he didn't, he didn't intend for us to be so, so blah about who his son is. He intended for us to, to be excited and shout it out and to be, to be willing to tell the world, you know what? I love Jesus. Amen. I love Jesus to the point that I'll tell you the truth out of love, and, and, and I want you to hear it. And I don't want to offend you or hurt your feelings or make you mad, but I'm going to tell you the truth because God's told me the truth. And that's my job, and that's your job. And we're going to get excited about it, and we're supposed to be God-centered and things change. But he says, hey, hey, I have chosen Jerusalem that my name might be there. And I've chosen David to be over my people because, listen, you people can't seem to figure it out without a leader. We can't. We're always looking for somebody. Somebody needs to lead me. Somebody lead me. Who's going to lead? If nobody, if nobody show, if pastor didn't show up today, would we all just sit in our seats? No, start worshiping God on your own. If, 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 if I fall over dead, somebody needs to be, start worshiping. Amen, right? We need to start worshiping. 
Not because I'm dead, but because, I, because God loves you still. But because God still loves you, and he's still, he's still showing up, and he's still here. He didn't, choose, he didn't want to choose people to lead. He wanted us to all serve others and love others and worship him. And then it goes on to say, Now it was in, my, in the heart of my father, David, to build a house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel, which is our God. It was in his heart. David felt like he was supposed to, to honor God, which is amazing. It's good. You know, it's in our heart to, to plant Mountain Grove. It's in our heart to plant other churches. But you know what? Maybe someday God's going to say, not you guys, but somebody else. I just want your faithful heart in the matter. Not you, but somebody else. Be willing to teach and love and, and, and preach. And, and maybe not you, but maybe someone over there in children's church right now. Maybe someone in the youth group. Maybe someone that's not even here yet is supposed to be the one to plant the next one. We've got to trust God in that. But he says, listen, it was in the heart of David to build a house for my name, for the name of God. But the Lord said to my father David, because it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well. You did well. And I love this because he's saying, listen, it's, I know it's, your heart was pure in the matter. You weren't wanting to build a church just to say, look at the church that David built. You were wanting to build a church to say, look at the church that God's in. The thick cloud, the love that he's there. Look at the church that God's in. That was David's heart. I think sometimes we've got to really, really humble ourselves down and be like, listen, it's not my church, it's his. I just get to attend it. It's not my body, it's his. I just get to be a part of it. And, 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 and we get so caught up. We get so caught up. And, and David had a heart. Even though David was a sinner and not perfect, he had a heart for God to be glorified. That's what he wanted. He wanted God to be glorified, and that's what he wanted. He said, and then he said nevertheless, you, you shall not build the house. He told David, you shall not build the house, but your son who will be born to you, he shall build the house in my name. David could have got bitter and angry. Well, why not me? Well, why not me? Why don't I get to build it? Why don't I get to build it? He could have got upset about it. But you know what? I think he was thinking generational blessing. He could have been a generational curse and just really ruffled the feathers and really messed some stuff up. But instead, you know, I think he said generational blessing. Solomon's going to get to do this. How amazing that my son's going to get to carry on the gospel because I'm doing good the best I can and loving my Lord. Where are you at today in that? Are you, are you, in, that, are you in that kind of mind frame that, that it's not about what you're going to do but about what maybe your children might get to do because of your faithfulness? Or what about those lost that are the same age as you? Or maybe those are a little older than you. Because your faithfulness, that they might get to do something because they watch you do it. And not for your own ego and your own greed, but for your love of God. I mean, that's when things really change. Is when you're like, it's not about me. It's about God. It's not about glorifying Dustin. Because listen, Dustin is a train wreck. But my God is perfect. Dustin is human, and he's going to fail, and he's going to sin. But you know what? When he does, he's really, really trying to repent, and he's trying to do right, and he's trying to do good, but he's still human. But my God is perfect. And so, and so we need to have a heart like David in that, because Solomon was blessed to be able to sit here and give this dedication of this temple, this church, because his father loved God. It doesn't even say that his father loved him so much that he got to be blessed to be king for that. It says because he loved God. Now the Lord has fulfilled his word which he spoke. And I, for I have risen in the place of my father. He told him he would. And he would sit on the throne of Israel. He told him he would. This is prophecy fulfilled. When we wonder why, how's the Bible true? You're reading truth right here. This is Bible prophecy fulfilled. And, and the Lord had promised and he built the house in the name of the lord for the god of israel and there i have set the ark in which is the covenant of the lord which he made 
with the sons of Israel. And if we remember, if we go back, a, I think a chapter or two, maybe just one chapter, we know what's in the, in the ark, right? The tablets. The two tablets. How special is that? That that got to be in the church because of their dedication. And then I love Solomon. Solomon is so humble in this moment. Listen, Solomon, the end of his life, was a struggle because he was human. And he lost focus of what God could do. But in this moment, he's all in with God, and he's, and he's, and he's full in. So he, built, he stood there before, the, before an altar that he built. He stood before an altar of the, in, of the Lord in the presence of the assembly of Israel. Listen, he's standing before all of the church, which there's a lot of people standing there watching what's going on. And this king, instead of saying, everybody bow to me, he, this king has... He's built an altar, right? It says he, he made a bronze platform, five cubits long, five cubits wide, and three, three cubits high. So it's pretty good size. It's pretty good size. He's built this. It's in the middle. It's in the midst, which is in the middle of the court. So he's right. He's in the middle of everybody, and he stood on it. And instead of, stand, you know, we, the human side of people, when we get power and we get leadership, we want to stand up there and make people bow to us. Well, no, we don't, Pastor. Yes, we do. We just don't make them bow to us physically. We make them bow to us in other ways. We make them feel inferior any time we can too often. Because in this world it says if you have power, that's all you need. But it, in the Bible it says you don't need one ounce of your own power because it's worthless. You need to be, you need to be able to say, you know what, I'm weak in that but my God will make me strong. I don't know how to get through this, but my God will give me an answer. I don't know what the answer to this is, but God does. And as we look at that, we see how, how humbled Solomon is right here. He stood on it, and then he knelt down on his knees in the presence of all the assembly of Israel. And he spread out his hands toward heaven. I want you to realize how unashamed he was in his praising of God. The power in this scripture should shake you to your core because none of us are doing this out there. When's the last time you knelt down in a, in a McDonald's and started praying to God? You know, I give the Muslim credit. They ain't afraid. When it's time to head to, to get on the rug and get them face east at their three or four times a day, at least they're willing to be faithful to it. Even though they're not worshiping the right thing, even though they're not doing the right thing and the book isn't right that they're reading, but you know what? They're faithful when Christians have the truth, the one Savior that actually rose from the dead and conquered death, and we won't worship God in public. I'm not talking turning your radio up loud because I love loud music. That doesn't count. Anybody can do that. I'm talking about really letting the world see that you love God. Really letting the world see that Jesus is your Lord and your Savior. And he's the change maker. That means maybe I pray in public. Maybe I pray privately, whatever it is. It means you are, you are putting God first. You got to build a house that invites God in. That means your temple, that's you. You need to invite God in. Your house that you live in, you need to invite God in. That needs to be a temple to him too. Your car, make that a temple to God. Your church, certainly better be a temple to God. And, and you need everything you do, everywhere you go, needs to be a temple to God. The office cubicle, people should be able to see you love Jesus in there. Well, pastor, I might get fired. Well, so be it. The God that created everything can find you another job. But, but we've got to be faithful in it. We've got to be faithful in who we are. This king who could have said, everybody bow to me now. Look at this great thing I've done. Look at this great thing I've done for God. Everybody bow to me now. He said, no, I'm, getting, I'm climbing up on this altar, and I am putting me as the sacrifice. He got down on his knees. He lifted his hands, and he didn't care what his people thought. He started to pray. He said, oh, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven or on earth, keeping covenant and showing loving kindness to your servants who walk before you with all their hearts. 
I think that's our problem. Problem found. We're not walking before God with all of our hearts seeking him out. Oh, we're walking before him like we got all the answers. We need to walk before him saying, God, I I need you. Come on, God, let's do this. And you know what he's going to say? I'm already with you. I'm already there. Just keep moving. We don't have a stagnant God. He doesn't want stagnant servants. Because if you're a stagnant servant and people got to come to you to be served, you are no longer a servant. You are now putting people below you. You have to have your heart and your life focused on other people getting saved. Do you ever wake up in the morning and ask this, Lord, how can I lead someone to you today? A lot of times we wake up, Lord, help me to be better. Lord, help me with my mouth. I can't seem to stop it. Lord, I don't know about this heart of mine. I try. I got my mama's heart or my daddy's heart or grandma was a little bitter. That's just who I am. You are the changer when you call upon God. And, and, and he changes the rest of it. How about you wake up and say today, Lord, no matter how bad it hurts, I want to lead someone to you. I believe you will, I believe you will show me someone. If I have to talk to somebody at work, and, and see no fruit of it. We were praying for Tucker this week because he was trying to witness to somebody at work. And he's like, I, I'm planting the seed, but bouncing it off rocks. Ever feel like that? Well, keep bouncing. Keep bouncing off the rocks. Because eventually God's going to keep tilling that heart up and something's going to land. We got to believe that. And so, and so we have to understand that we have to call upon God and ask him to use us for him, not for us. It should just be the nature of our walk that we change. It, it, so it should be the nature of the walk that you stop cussing because that doesn't show Jesus very well. Well, pastor, I don't know how to do it. I've done it my whole life. You know what? God, God can shut it off if you really ask him. Amen. Start reading this. There's a whole bunch of words in here. That you, can, that you can adopt. And there's, there's just a change when you start to really, really focus on what God has for you. Your actions change. Your thoughts change. Your, your life changes. Or it should. If it's not, you've got to ask yourself, am I really, really making myself the sacrifice at the altar? I get this all the time. Pastor, why do we do an altar call every single time? Was it just show? I don't know. I don't know their heart. I hope not. But if they go down there and show off like that enough, maybe they'll meet Jesus. But, you know, I, it's not my spot to say, well, hey, they've been here three times this week. They've shown up every Sunday. This person comes every Sunday to the altar. But I think they, they are you not fixed yet? Not, it's not the dog pound. You don't just go and get neutered and come back and you're good. <laughs> Sit on the porch and like, that's not going to be good. That's not good. <laughs> Hayden, <laughs> I did. We're getting off the porch. We're getting off the porch. We're getting off the porch. Lord, help us. The person that walks up here every single Sunday and appear every Sunday, and appear every Sunday, and appear every Sunday. At least they're laying themselves out on an altar. Solomon laid himself out on an altar. Lifted his hands up to heaven and didn't care what what all of his people thought. They didn't say, we have a weak king, look at him. Look at him needing help from God. Look at this king needing help from God. How weak is he? I hope that whenever you come to church and you look at your pastor, I hope you look at him and say, oh, he needs help. He does. He needs help from God. He needs help from God to get up and do it right. He needs help from God to do it right all afternoon. He needs help from God to do it right in the evening. He needs help from God to go to bed at night and lay his head down and get some rest. And everything in between, he needs help from God. 
Don't ever look at the person up there and say, that person has it together. I want to be like that person. That person's a messed up, screwed up human being that needs help from God. But you know what? They're just like these people out here. I love every one of you. But you know what? You need help from God. You all need help from God. You, we, and here's the awesome thing is we have a God that says, come to me. Come to me. Receive me. Let me change you. But we got to want to be changed. I hope you came to church today thinking, I want to be different than when I came in. I want to be different so that when I go back out there, I look different. So people don't look at me and say, well, you know, they go to that renovation church. I had people get mad because I talked about how the church is against drugs. And it's okay. It's fine because you know what? Because they're human. They need help. Just like I need help. And just like you need help. Because none of us have it all figured out. But we have this Bible, God's Word, that will speak right to us. It will pierce our hearts. It will change who we are. It'll modify your mind. It'll change your eternity. I'm tired of people leaving disasters when they can leave a legacy. Amen. I'm not talking about a legacy of how great Dustin is. I want to leave a legacy of how great God was in Dustin's life. Amen. I want my kids to be those kids that say, you know what, I want to be like God wants me to be because I've seen what they did, what God did in my God, to my dad. I've seen what he did to my dad and my mom. And I want him to do those things to me, but even better. And then I want my grandkids to say, you know what? I want God to change me because I've seen my, my mom and my grandpa and my grandma change. I want us to be very serious about an altar. I want us to desire a life. You know, people tell me all the time, you, you guys make a big deal about an altar. I Listen, Solomon made a, big, Solomon made a real big deal about an altar. He humbled himself in front of everybody, saying, I am not the powerful one, but he is. And I'm going to lay my arms out here to God, and I'm just going to pray. Pray for all of you. That's what he did. He prayed for all of them. What a great, great server. Have you ever laid yourself out on an altar to just be the sacrifice? If you have, that's awesome. If you haven't, let it happen. Doesn't make you less of a man. Doesn't make you less of a woman. It actually makes you something so much more powerful. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know what the disaster is or what the trauma is or what the struggle is. Or maybe it's pretty good, but it needs to be better. Come down here and ask him to give a legacy that matters. Come down and talk to the God that can change things. The altar's yours. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise this morning. Amen? Oh, yeah. All right. Okay, folks. Um, tithe boxes are on the wall back near the door. If you haven't been to one of our creek services, today, uh, then today would be a great time to come out. Um, if you haven't been baptized before, this is a good day to do it. Um, so we kind of make a deal out of this. We don't just go out there and do baptisms. We also, we're going to bring some food. We'll have a picnic. It is a great day to just get to hang out with each other. Um, it, 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 these are just good days. And it's a great day for people to come out and be able to get in there and get baptized and show the world that they're gods. Amen. Um, I wanted to, so um, that little uh, passage that we watched earlier, it wasn't a passage, it's a short message from Alistair Begg. Um, for uh, folks, a as you go through the week, one thing that kind of helps is to turn on your radio and be able to listen to someone like that who is a wonderful pastor. And I promise you, guys like Alistair Begg are just great. That what the, um, they are men of God, and they are placed here on this earth, and they are given big jobs by God, and they do a wonderful job of it. This is the passage that he was talking about, and I want to share that with you real quick. And this is from the Gospel of Luke. One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? 
And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he, that's Jesus, said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So what Pastor Begg was talking about on that passage, it is a wonderful message. Okay? When, they, when we call him the thief on the cross or the criminal on the cross, understand one thing. It was actually a lot worse than just being a thief. You and I might think about a thief as just being a pickpocket or maybe just a shoplifter. But even back then, people didn't get the death penalty for being a pickpocket or a shoplifter. Okay? This was a really big deal. And these were really bad guys. And that's why the one thief or criminal said to the other, we're getting what we deserve. And they were. But nonetheless, all that person had to do was say to Jesus, remember me. And Jesus' reply was, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. That is just, if you take nothing else from that, understand this, besides Jesus loves you a whole bunch, is this, absent with, from the body and present with the Lord. And it is wonderful and is something great to know. Because one day we're all going to be there at that point. We're going to close our eyes for the last time. And so when, we, when they open back up, it's not going to be these eyes. It's going to be the spiritual eyes. And we're going to get to hang out with Jesus in this beautiful place called paradise for a while. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, we just bow before you today.